seated. Man, what fun that was worshiping with you guys this morning. Thank you for jumping in full steam and worshiping along with us. You know, the charm of a portable church is like going back to when you're a kid and you had to hold the antenna for your dad as he's watching the football game. It's like, don't move. Uh, so let's give Aaron a round of applause. He, he fixed the TVs in the middle of worship. I was like, don't move, Aaron. Don't move. Every time you move, it's perfect. All right. But uh, thank you, man. We really appreciate that. You know, today is a really great morning to come to Anchor Church. I'm very excited about the passage of Scripture that we're going to be jumping into. It's Mark chapter 10. And Mark chapter 10 gives us this beautiful picture of how each of us should approach God, how we should come to God. And there's two examples here, one of what not to do and one of what to do. And very rarely does Jesus just come out so straight forward in the scripture and spell it out for the disciples and the listeners. Usually he leads them to an aha moment, but this is one of those very straightforward moments that's found in Mark chapter 10. And so if you have your Bibles, you can open up to page 846. Um, that's the, the place that we use in Mark chapter 10, the, the Bibles that we use, and you can find it right along. You can read with me. And I, I want to read to you the very first section here. It says in verse 13, and they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God is like a child, shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Uh, I'm a dad of three, maybe four, five, six, seven, eight, nine kids at any point, depends on who's in the neighborhood hanging out at our house at any given time. Uh, one of the greatest joys that I have is spending time with young people. Before I started Anchor Church and God called us to step out in faith, uh, to be a church in the Northeast Heights that reaches out to people that, to see lives transformed by Jesus for the glory of Jesus, to be known more for what we do than what we're against. Before God set me on this pastoral journey, I was a youth pastor uh, for about 12 years. I worked with teenagers. Uh, it was an awesome experience. I always said, you know, give me kids when they're 11, right? It's like, I'll skip the one through 10. I'll just take them when they're in the sixth grade. I know how to work with a sixth grader through a senior. Most parents are like, I'll give them to you when they're 11 <laughs> through 18, right? They hit those stages and they're like, okay, let's send them to people who know how to have handle a raging, crazy teenager, right? And, but I love that stage of life so much. And I've, I've always said I'm still a youth pastor at heart because I love to pour into young people. I don't believe that young people are the future of the church. I know that they are the church. And in Mark chapter 10, Jesus leads us to this moment where he calls us to a higher view of children. And in fact, he calls us to follow their example. Uh, we say things like, do as I say, not as I do to our children, right? For driving, maybe our language, uh, what we eat, you know, decisions like that. When they catch us doing something bad, we say, do as I say, not as I do, right? And kids are an incredible example of, of people who repeat what they see. Right? You can hang out with my kids, and you spend an hour with them, you'll figure out what my life is like at home, okay? You're going to find out the secrets of the Bridge family. They're just going to spill it all out for you. But I, I love watching children play because little kids repeat what they see. Uh, you see children, they want to play dress up, and they want to mow the lawn, and they want to make lunch. You're like, what are you doing? Well, I'm fixing dinner for everyone. They, they follow what they see. That's why it's always very interesting when you see little kids that are acting outside of normal behavior. It's a very scary moment, and so they follow <coughs> our lead, but Jesus brings him this place and says, you know what? I want you to follow the lead of a child in how you approach me. If you're so used to teaching kids what to say, how to act and behave, but I want you to take a lesson 
from children. And he starts off in verse 13, it says, And they were bringing children to him, that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. You know, this beautiful picture of people just flooding of Jesus, and they're bringing kids to Jesus, just so Jesus can interact with them. Have you ever seen someone handle children? I, I'm usually the guy where a person hands me a baby and they start to cry. Anybody can relate out there? Like you get the kid and they yell and they scream and they're crying. You're like, oh, just give them back, right? But have you found those people in life where whenever they're around kids, they're like a magnet? You know, the kids are just drawn to them. They smile. They giggle with them. They they laugh. These, these people are remarkable. I see people like this in our church all the time. Like the, the guy who fixed our TV. He, he, he's a guy who brings in dodgeballs after church every Sunday. And while we're supposed to be tearing church and putting it down, he's chucking dodgeballs at little children, knocking them in the head and the shoulder. But they love him. He goes and he takes their shoes and he hides them all over the church. And whenever he's at a house, he hides. And, and they're just drawn to that kind of... Fun, relatability, and, and, and Jesus is not annoyed by kids in this situation. You think that, gosh, he's so busy. He's always giving himself away. He's teaching. There's large crowds. And the disciples, they, they come along, and when, here's what they say, verse 14, but when Jesus saw it, he was indignant to these disciples who rebuked them. He said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. The disciples are telling these people, just leave Jesus alone. Take the kids out. Uh, maybe you guys ha have been in a social situation as a parent, and you've got kids around, and you're at a restaurant, and you're trying to hush them and calm them. You don't want them walking up to tables to say hi to people and talk to them and steal their french fries, right? <laughs> trying to control that child. And so you, you, you're kind of like the disciples in this case. That's what they're doing. They're like, just, just leave Jesus to speak. He wants to eat his meal in peace, okay? And, and Jesus becomes indignant. The, the scriptures here, uh, when it says indignant, it has this picture uh, of a cloud, a storm cloud brewing, that you see the storm coming in, and he is upset. He is upset. He rebukes them. He says in verse 14, don't prevent them. Don't hinder them from coming to me. Wow. Those are really strong words, because we might think to ourselves, okay, well, I'm not I'm not holding children back from going to Jesus. I'm not keeping them from, I'm not putting a barricade around Jesus. And, you know, I'm not doing anything to keep children from following Jesus. But then we begin to look at our lives. And we look at how we interact with the kids in the neighborhood at the grocery store. I think that in a lot of ways, we can keep kids from seeing Jesus oftentimes and how we treat children and how we behave. Are, are we those people who are, are uptight all the time and pushing kids away and we don't want to be around them? We don't want to be bothered by them. We don't want them in our house knocking over our knickknacks kind of a situation here. And, and sometimes we have the opposite effect where the lifestyle we live it's a lifestyle that doesn't have consistency in character. And so the children who are always watching us, and they see the inconsistencies in our life, they say, you know what, if that's what it means to follow Jesus, then I don't want to have anything to do with that when I'm older. There's an old saying that parents are the number one influencers on kids. And when they become teenagers, parents feel like they've lost their influence because they're starting to hang out with other friends and they watch TV and they get online and they're always glued to their phone and so we feel like well we're no longer an influence and so we step back but statistics show us that they still are the number one influencer even in bad kids you look at them as the number one influencer and you gotta ask yourself am I gonna be a good influence or a bad influence to these kids uh, Jesus is saying don't hinder the children from coming to me. Or we must all look at our lives and ask ourselves the question, is there anything in my character or my actions or what I am doing that is keeping kids 
from coming to know Jesus. When I was a young child, I liked to wear a hat in a church. And my mom said, don't wear a hat in church, Jared. You're going to go bald. And I was like, whatever, Mom. I love baseball, and I love hats, and I'm going to be in the MLB. I better start wearing a hat. I've got to get used to it. I want to wear a hat. And I remember sitting in a very traditional church wearing a baseball cap. And I believe him to be a nice older gentleman in the church who was really probably trying to look out for my interests, tapped me on the shoulder, but in a gruff, mean voice said, son, you take that hat off in church. Don't you know it's time to respect your God? And I was just a kid. I didn't understand. I didn't see that as a barrier for me worshiping God, but he had taken a verse from Timothy and the tradition of his day and applied it to that context. And I got to thinking, I know my God accepts me even if I'm wearing a hat. And I can still worship God even if I'm wearing a hat. And I said, I don't ever want to be someone who hinders a young person from hearing about Jesus and following Jesus. There's a gentleman who goes to our church and he's a lot older. And he says to me a couple weeks ago, Jared, you know, if I had it my way, I wouldn't go to your church. Oh, thank you, sir. I'm so <laughs> grateful for that word of encouragement. Pastor Appreciation Month has reached a whole new level. He said, don't get me wrong. I love you, and I want to invest you, but I want you and this church to grow and succeed. And so I might choose an old Baptist hymnal. I might choose a different style of ministry, but I'm willing to put some sacrifice on the table so that People who are far from God can come to know Jesus that I can't reach any other way. Is there anything in your life or our life? Maybe it's the tension in a marriage and the relationship, the constant fighting. We smile when we're out in public and we go to church, but the chaos of life and the expectations of life have hit home so hard. And we're constantly fighting in front of our kids and they look at our character and they see it as inconsistent. Uh, or maybe it's our stylistic preference. Or we don't want to be around kids and their loud music. But is there anything in our lives that as a church and as individuals we are doing to hinder children from coming to know. He says, don't hinder them. And then he elevates the role of a child in society. He says this, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. One scholar writes about this day and age, and he's commenting on a journal that was found because the voice of a man carried so much weight in this culture. And children were not seen as a priority in culture. They were the type of people where today they should be seen and not heard heard kind of comments, if you've ever heard that. That was what took place in that society. Children were not very valuable. And so uh, the voice of a man in this day and age actually could dismiss a child from his family and face no repercussions from the community. If the child was one that was acting out or he didn't even want. One, one person wrote that if I'm having a son you may keep him. If I'm having a daughter, dismiss her. Get rid of her. This culture had a low view of children. And Jesus elevates their place in society by inviting them in. Let them have the front and center view of me. They are welcome around me. And then he elevates their position of faith. He tells them, the kingdom of God belongs to them. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, like a child, shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and he blessed them, laying his hands on them. He elevates their place in society and he elevates their faith in society. He points them out and says, this is the model. This is the way you should come to me. And this is not a picture of you should be childish to God. 
you should be whimsical in such a way that you're, you're not in awe of who he is or respecting his authority, his power, and his justice. Uh, th this is not saying you should come to God ignorant. This is not saying that you come to God like a pathetic child at, in a situation of its lowest. No, it's actually saying you come to God like a dependent child. I was always amazed at the relationship my wife shared with our children when they were so young. I mean, I could comfort my kids. I could hold them in my arms in those infancy days. But there was no one like Mama. The bond that they shared in the womb carried out into the world. And I would watch how my wife would lovingly provide, care for, and take care of our kids. They were 100% dependent upon them. Grandma's cookies could help Dad, but it couldn't help the baby. The uncles could help Dad, but it couldn't help. The baby. The, no one else could help that child like mama. And that relationship that that child shared with mom was 100% dependence. And so this picture here of what Jesus is saying, he's saying, come to me like a child for theirs is the kingdom of God. He is saying, come to God with complete dependence upon him for life, to be sustained by your parent. That's how we approach God. There's another side to this story in Mark chapter 10 because someone else comes to God in a very different way. Verse 17 of Mark chapter 10 says, And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus is just set, setting out on his journey. He is taking off. He spent his time with the kids. He has enjoyed blessing them, changing people's perception on children and their relationship with God. And as he's setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him. I don't know about you, but nobody's ever run up to me and knelt before me. Picture that setting. You're setting out for a weekend trip over Labor Day. You're getting your bags packed. You're ready to go. You're focused on somewhere else. And someone accosts you, runs you down, grabs you, gets a hold of you, and kneels before you. You don't know this person. You've never seen this person. And they say to you, good teacher, what must I do to go with you on vacation? Right? You're thinking... Who, who are you? Why are you treating me this way? This was not a customary way of greeting in this culture. It wasn't how you introduced yourself. But this rich, young ruler and rich man, as another gospel would put it, it he comes before Jesus with this posture of kneeling before and says, Good teacher. In the context of this language, the equivalent would be saying, Deity, what must I do? Good God, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I'm sure this man had heard stories about Jesus, maybe seen, in fact, firsthand miracles that Jesus had performed, but he had not yet met Jesus. And to call Jesus a good teacher, saying, Godly rabbi, God, deity, here in the flesh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He comes with this very strange posture for introducing himself to God. You can see it continue here. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? That's how we know this is not customary. That's how we know that most people are not approaching Jesus in this Manner. Jesus questions the man. Why are you calling me good? Why, why are you calling me God? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. 
Jesus doesn't list all of the Ten Commandments, but I think he's very skillful here. He identifies and lists pretty obtainable commandments, right? Do not murder. Check. All right, I'm, I'm pretty good. Do not commit adultery. Okay, check. I'm doing pretty good. Do not steal. Okay, I, I have no need to steal. I'm a rich young ruler. I'm doing really good. Do not bear false witness. I'm hanging in there. Do not defraud. Oh, why would I defraud? I've got all money. I'm fine. Honor your father and mother. Oh, they're so proud of me. Look at the man I've become. I think Jesus is setting him up here with these Ten Commandments. He's luring him in a little bit. In verse 20, he said to him, Teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. We know he responds with that kind of pompous, arrogant attitude because of the rest of the story. He says, teacher, I'm solid here. I think I've got this. But what I'm looking for is this one thing. What am I missing here? In the aorist tense of this passage of scripture, the Greek grammar, he's asking, what's the one thing I can do right now to seal the deal for all of eternity? Verse 21, and Jesus, looking at him, loved him. I, I, I love this. He says the truth in love. I mean, I've got mom, a mom and dad. I've got a wife. I've got people that care about me. I've got people that have spoke the truth to me in love, that they see things in me that is ugly, that I don't even like, and I don't want to hear you have anything in your life that you don't want to hear? You don't want somebody else speaking truth into your life, telling you that you need to make some changes here? Jesus loved this person. I like the way people react, you know, with their friends. They're, like, They're my friend because they let me get away with everything. They make me feel safe and comfortable when I want to do wrong. They don't judge me, right? But a real friend speaks the truth in Love. A real friend's going to tell you where you're going wrong. And so Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Jesus hadn't mentioned this commandment earlier found in Exodus 20 chapter 3, chapter 20 verse 3. He, he didn't mention this commandment in his first set of things you should and shouldn't do. Jesus gets to the one thing that this man really struggled with. This was his God that he put, put before the one true God. This was his idolatry. It was his wealth. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, I think it really sums things up here. Here's what it says in Revelation 3, verse 17. It says, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. For the rich young ruler, I believe that he felt like everything was on track, that he had it all lined up, and that the question of what must I do to inherit eternal life was really, hey, God, let's kind of look through my life, and I want to show to you how good I am, and you'd be glad to have me on your team. Now, he looks at his life, Jesus sees the one thing, the one God he's put before Jesus, and it's his wealth. It's like, oh, you've got all this money. You think that everything's going well for you, but you're neglecting this whole other side that is so ugly. Now, this is not an aesthetic call to abandon all from Jesus. This is not even a blanket call for all Christians and all people of God to do. In the New Testament and Old Testament, God identifies people who are wealthy 
and they use their wealth for the kingdom of God. God, in fact, blesses certain people with wealth. If you look at Boaz, who's able to take on Ruth as a wife because of his wealth. You look at Abraham, who is able to set out on a journey and begin the family of God and the Israelites as a uh, patriarch who's got all kinds of herds and wealth and family. And you, you look at person after person, David, Solomon, Job even. Our classic example of suffering is a man who spent most of his life as wealthy. Joseph of Arimathea in the New Testament is able to give a tomb for Jesus to reside in, to bless God. The, the woman who's able to break open the perfume and wash the feet of Christ in a lavish, loving way. This is not a call to aesthetic living, to abandon all, to have any kind of wealth. No, we should all be poor and destitute as followers of God. No, this is an individual command to this man. Whose God was money. He says, you're coming to me not like a child, dependent upon me. You're coming to me with your wealth here on earth, your accomplishment, your position. And you're trying to buy the kingdom of heaven. And this type of arrogant approach is not going to fly. Verse 22 Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus has called for this man to abandon all, to give it all away for the kingdom of God. To say, no other gods before me. This is your God you've put above me. Let's get rid of it. Let's move that obstacle out of the way. You trust and follow me. I'll provide for you, but get rid of it. And he couldn't do it. He couldn't come to God like a child with that complete dependence upon God. Verse 23. He looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. He, he's writing to ancient Palestine, the Middle East. This summer, as we came back from our mission trip from Kenya, we spent time uh, in the United Arab Emirates. We got to hang out in Dubai and for all of its great, grand Buildings and incredibly, it's like Las Vegas on steroids. 15 Las Vegas is laid out for all this incredible, lavish living. The one animal that was elevated above all was the camel. Museum after museum identified the camel. Art and architecture identified the camel. This was the largest and most durable animal for this region. And so Jesus, he doesn't pick an elephant. Because they probably haven't seen an elephant. He picks their version of a largest animal. And he says, how hard is it to get to heaven? Well, it'd be easier for that giant camel that carries all of that water to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 26, and they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved, Jesus? And this is great for Americans. Like, we need to realize we're all rich. Whether we're on Social Security or Medicaid or not, if you live in America, if you've got a couch, if you can watch TV, if you have a cell phone, you are in the world's top 5% of wealth. Most people make less than a dollar a day. I tried explaining that to my seven-year-old this week. Well, why do they only make a dollar a day? Uh, well, because that's all that they can give. Don't they work as hard as you guys, Daddy? Yes, they do. But they only make a dollar a day. That's what the rest of the world deals with. So if you make more than a dollar a day, you are boo-boo bucks rich, okay? You might have a mortgage and some car payments, and you might be stressed, and you might be thinking, I'd love to make more an hour. But the reality is... We're all wealthy, and we might ask ourselves, well, then, oh my gosh, who can be saved? Jesus looked at them in verse 27 and said, with man it is impossible, 
with man, no one can meet all Ten Commandments. No one can meet the, the commandments that honor God and the commandments that honor their fellow human. With, with, with man, no one can be perfect. With man, no one can purchase the kingdom of heaven. With man, it's really hard to approach God like a child. Like we've become adults and we're self-sufficient and we, we pride ourselves in our hard work. But with man, it's impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. For all things are possible with God. Verse 28, Peter began to say to him, he's beginning to say to him, he, he, he began, he said, see, we've left everything and followed you. And Jesus says to Peter, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left who has, or there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with, with persecution and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last. And the last will be first. Jesus answers Peter and he says, you've abandoned all. You're following the call. There's no other gods before you. Wealth is not your God. You're following me. And there's a reward for that kind of behavior. There is a reward for that kind of abandonment to everything here on earth and all that earth has to offer. And the reward is eternity with God in heaven. A place where it says, hey, here on earth, you left behind those who were against you and against me. Maybe they were brothers or sisters. Uh, maybe it was the land that you left behind and you sacrificed the houses that you could have bought and built and rented out and you could have made a huge killing in the open market for. You left all that behind for the sake of the call, the kingdom of God. And your reward is far greater than anything you could ever imagine here on earth. Think about the yacht that the richest person on the world owns. Think about that. Picture that. It hails in comparison to the eternity with God in heaven that awaits each of us. Think about the relationships that you've abandoned because of following Jesus. That people said, you know what, I'm not on that train with you yet. They were the people that you used to party with and that you used to spend all kinds of time with and that you used to even make fun of Christians with. And then God got a hold of your heart. He captured your heart. He rescued you. He saved you. He forgave you. And you're eternally grateful. And so you're going to follow him. And things are going to look different. And you're going to talk different. And you're going to spend your money in different ways. And everybody's still wanting to party. And they are looking at you like you're the craziest person on the planet. And slowly but surely they distance themselves from you. Those relationships that you sacrifice in heaven, you are going to spend the rest of eternity with all of the saints, the followers of God, the family of God, and you are going to have so much fun. You know, there's a lot of friends from my early days in life that I really cared about, spent the majority of my upbringing with, and I miss those friends dearly, and they miss me, but God's got us scattered. People are pastors in other churches in other towns now. People are doing ministry, and guys that I was just charging the gates of hell against with. We're all over the place, but we just miss each other. And I came to this realization. God has placed us in other situations to be used for the glory of God so that others can follow him and fall in love with Jesus. And guess what? Guys, we don't get to hang out like we used to, but we're going to get to spend the rest of eternity hanging out together. The reward is riches and relationships that are far beyond what we can ever imagine here on earth. Jesus calls this rich young ruler to divest himself of all of his wealth and invest himself into the kingdom of God. But he couldn't do it. And he walked away disappointed. Back to back stories. The question is, how will you respond to God's call? Will you have a hardened 
self-sufficient and reliant heart towards God, or will you come like a child, naive, open, available, and dependent? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, and we ask that we would never get to that place of a heart that's like the rich young ruler. And God, it might not be money. It might be a job. It might be a relationship. It might be a fixation or even an addiction that we've placed before you as another God. And Lord, we ask that instead of being dependent upon our wealth, our friendships, or how we feel when we purchase something, Lord, that we abandon all of that that we divest ourselves of that, that we get rid of that, and instead we invest ourselves into the kingdom of God. Lord, that there'd be nothing to prevent us from walking with you and accomplishing all that you want us to. Lord, may we be like those children who come to you, excited to be around you, and totally dependent upon you. And maybe, God, this morning there's people here today that they sure have tried. Over and over they have tried to do it on their own, to be self-reliant, to figure it out, to take care of the loneliness, to fill the void uh, that they're looking for in their life, to fill the purpose that they are just struggling to reach, Lord, with so many different things other than you. And today, Lord, I pray that it could be the moment where they abandon all of that and they say to you right now, God, I couldn't do it. I didn't do it. I'm still lost. I'm still lonely. I'm still in need of you. God, I'm dependent upon you. For the first time in my life, I see that. I need you for every breath. I need you for my purpose. I need you to take care of my sin problem that I can't do on my own. God, I need you for eternity. If that's you, and you're feeling that way today, and pride's kept you from a relationship with God, I say you put it aside. No amount of good living that you've done will add up for salvation. I say you, you abandon it right now. You say, God, forgive me of my sin. I believe in you. I confess my need for you, and I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name. Well, guys, we are a church made up of two services at 9 and 1030, and we're having a family party, a potluck pumpkin picnic next Saturday at 11 o'clock. Bring your favorite dish. We're going to be out here on the park. We're going to be carving pumpkins, so bring a pumpkin for you and your friends. Bring some food. We're going to have a blast out here. It's one of our anchor hangs that Hosanna's putting together. Uh, we'd love to get to know you outside of just a Sunday morning service and maybe introduce you to some other folks. You get to know people. Uh, you can throw pumpkin seeds at me. I'm cool with it. It's going to be a blast. So uh, we'll have a little pumpkin seed war, uh, but it's going to be a lot of fun. So we invite you to come hang out with us next week. If you're looking to get connected and get to know some other people and do life with others. Uh, we've got some great community groups that are popping up and that are in full force. And so if you want to be a part of that, one meets right now at 1030 in the atrium. Great Bible study. Uh, and others meet throughout the week in people's homes. So we invite you to check that out. Stick around. Uh, be a part of it. Get to know some folks. Uh, check mark the box that says community group and uh, we'll get in contact with you and share some uh, things that we have available. You can go check it out already, even online at anchorchurch.com and uh, you know, kind of scout those out. My wife's waving to me. Oh, yeah. She was doing the, she wasn't waving. She was doing a baptism sign right there. I, I don't speak wife sign language, sorry. Uh, but thank you for reminding me. Next Sunday is Baptism Sunday. And so if you want to get baptized, it's going to be a blast. Uh, we've already got people in line ready to go. And we're going to have a baptism tank out here. And so thank you for reminding me about that. So if you've never been baptized, you want to be baptized, fill out the card. Let us know. Uh, you need to come back next week because this is why we do church, right? The family of God uh, going public with their family faith. We want to rally behind those people, support them, cheer them on, and throw a little party for them. So it's going to be a great weekend. Thanks. You guys have a great week. Bye-bye.